Next slide. Now let's move on to the three opportunities where HR leaders have maximum scope to take immediate action. The first opportunity is tapping into the rapid innovation in the healthcare market by exploring different vendors for EAPs, health programs, and digital solutions with a sharp focus on selecting a portfolio that's best suited for your company. The second opportunity lies in moving away from a traditional one-size-fits-all approach to the benefits model to one that is more individualistic and tailored to employee needs. And thirdly, we recognize that mental health has received a lot of public, public attention lately, but there's so much work to be done in this space. Stigma continues to be prevalent in many workplaces and it affects employees' abilities to come forward and seek treatment and ask their managers for support. Now let's consider the first opportunity. There is a plethora of new options available to well-being leaders. There are at least 50 to 60 new vendors for employee assistance programs alone and hundreds of digital apps and tools. Most participants in our interviews had experimented with different apps for resilience training, telehealth, and digital coaching. So all of these um, new solutions um, have similar claims. So, and these claims are of, on the order of uh, providing a better employee experience or a higher quality of care. And this is in comparison to the traditional plans that companies already have. But at present, there isn't um, a reliable way of assessing these claims or a reliable calculation of the ROI of these vendors. So we, overall, we know that digital innovation can offer tremendous benefits, but this rapid pace of innovation is making it challenging to keep up with the new offerings. How do you evaluate a new vendor and assess their credibility? Some other points to consider include duplication of resources, users' data privacy, and integrating new platforms with existing benefits. To sum up with an example, suppose an organization wants to introduce a new app for mindfulness training that has been rated highly by a certain employee demographic within the company. Then what is the business case for this app when the existing healthcare provider already offers some type of meditation training? And how do you calculate the ROI for the supplemental offering in addition to the existing benefits? What are the risks in sharing all of this data with an external partner? And finally, what's the best way to consolidate old and new resources to offer an integrated platform rather than fragmented solutions that can overwhelm the user? As you can see, the crux of this issue is that rapid digital innovation could complicate healthcare for employees instead of simplifying it if it's not done correctly. Moving on to the second opportunity, we have heard over and over again that there's no one size fits all approach to well being. When we ask companies to share the top mental health concerns by employee subgroup, there were few overlaps in mental health needs. Individual needs depend on so many factors, such as age group, region, job role, culture, et cetera. We also know um, because of the experience from the pandemic that an external stressor will affect employees very differently depending on their socioeconomic situation. Some of you may be familiar that the traditional approach towards benefits has relied on the 80-20 rule, which means designed primarily for the majority 80%. So the rationale here is that focusing resources on majority needs would yield the best outcomes in the most cost-effective way possible. But this approach isn't keeping up with the times because it doesn't serve the needs of specific groups, such as employees with children, people with aging parents, and in some cultures, single employees who live with their parents and extended families. Other points to consider include the growing segment of Gen Z workers and new hires put at greater risk for social isolation. We also know that frontline and early workers are more likely to experience financial stress, whereas salaried workers and caregivers are more likely to experience burnout. So if you're moving away from the old model, what should an old model look like in implementation? In companies that have a dedicated team for custom approaches, 
We're seeing opportunities for employees to self-identify as part of a high-risk group while ensuring privacy and confidentiality. After this self-identification process, employees are automatically sent emails about the mental health resources most relevant for them, and some groups are automatically made eligible for extended paid time off. We're also seeing, uh, we're also seeing financial literacy trainings in onboarding programs for new hires. In global companies, there's a trend towards decentralized wellness programming that's being led by human resource business partners and wellness champions at the grassroots level. Then there are many companies who are switching to vendors with a strong presence in local markets and engaging content that's available in multiple languages. So overall, we recognize that the traditional centralized benefits model has been around because it offers many advantages, but a staggered approach to localization can offset the higher costs through improved engagement and utilization of mental health resources. The third theme is the pervasive stigma around mental health, which makes employees reluctant to use the resources available to them or ask their managers and colleagues for support. Stigma is not the same as a lack of resources. It's a self-imposed barrier resulting from cultural perceptions around mental health. Stigma also occurs at an organization level when fewer resources are invested in mental health compared to other aspects of well-being, such as physical health. But stigma differs by culture, country, demographics, and other factors. So a global awareness campaign that takes place once a year may not achieve the desired impact for reducing stigma. There's a need to work closely with employees to create engaging communication campaigns that resonate with the target audience. We've heard of companies implementing stigma reducing campaigns and some of the effective components of such a strategy looks, looks like a focused campaign with relevant messaging and a high recall value or a stickiness, camp, or stickiness component of um, where employees are emotionally invested in, in the campaign. Such a campaign requires a comprehensive communication strategy with a balance of digital and non-digital platforms. Use creative posters and booklets to reach frontline employees who may not always be at their computers. Thirdly, educating managers plays the single most important role in reducing stigma because a company could have generous benefits such as paid time off or extended work from home policies, but employees may be reluctant to approach their managers for these benefits. To create a psychologically safe workplace, have open conversations on difficult topics, bring up current events and how team members are coping with them. And this can also help employees to be more self-aware and start balancing their work-life priorities. Another important point is that culture always starts at the top. So when leaders talk about their personal stories in town halls and team meetings, it can encourage employees to be more self-aware and comfortable asking for help. 